is EWA Radio, the official podcast of the Education Writers Association, and I'm public editor Emily Richmond. With the nation's eyes turned toward Congress and the possible impeachment of President Trump, how are civics teachers using current events to engage and inform students? And what role should education reporters play in amplifying those conversations? Stephen Sawchuk of Education Week is closely following how current events are playing out in the nation's classrooms and is here with some helpful background research and tips for reporters uncovering the impeachment process. Steve, welcome back to EWA Radio. Thanks again for having me. Impeachment is obviously a rare event, but it's also unique among some of the lessons that teachers might teach about the Constitution. Why is that? I think one thing to remember is that impeachment is obviously very controversial in this moment. But unlike some of the other controversial events that tend to come up in classrooms, abortion, the death penalty, gay marriage, impeachment is actually spelled out as a process in the Constitution fairly specifically. I mean, it outlines a process by which the House holds an impeachment inquiry, and then if the president is impeached, then it goes over to the Senate or the decision about whether to remove the president. So it is a very specific topic. For example, the Federalist Papers, there are a number of those that center specifically on the process of impeachment. Now, of course, some things aren't as clear. For example, what constitutes high crimes and misdemeanors? That is not really articulated other than in that phrase. So there are still ambiguities around the process. Well, that's really interesting. And I like how you explain that, that there can certainly be debate on whether or not it should happen. But It's very clear that students who are future citizens and voters in this society should understand how it's supposed to happen, the process. Correct. And, you know, one thing that I think we often hear these days is that politics don't belong in the classroom. And in this case, I think that's just wrong, right? I mean, the framers of the Constitution were very clear that impeachment is a political process. That's a different question than, you know, whether you want to make it partisan, you know, whether or not you think the grounds in which it's being brought up this time are correct or not correct or should be brought up or whether it's because of some sort of partisan maneuvering. The impeachment process is a political process. And the writers of the Constitution were clear about that. What do we know about how schools and educators handled the last time a president faced impeachment? That, of course, was President Clinton about 20 years ago. I tried to do some research through our archives about this to figure out were some of the same issues that I was hearing teachers struggle with this time around, were they also on the table in 1998? And what was interesting about it was that that was also very polarizing. Partisan politics were with us in 1998. However, that did not seem to be the first and foremost issue that teachers were struggling with at the time when they were teaching this. Instead, it was more the content, especially in the lower grades, with teachers having to be very circumspect about these sort of sordid details about Clinton's sex life, right? That seemed to be more of a the top issue that, that was affecting them. And of course, when we look back 21 years, cable news was still reasonably new. We didn't have microblogging. We didn't have social media in the way that we do now. Although at the time, I remember thinking, wow, this is moving very, very fast. It's somewhat slower and less high-pitched than it is now. It definitely was. I think that's a fair way to say it. I mean, I can remember back then and We used to have these things, listeners out there who may not know about this, we had things called internet cafes where people (laughs) paid by the minute to get online and and use this magical thing. (laughs) I know, this the World Wide Web. And I can remember the internet cafe in Palo Alto, California, offering free time to people to come in and and read the Star Report online and read all about all the shenanigans inside the White House. Right. Now, of course, we're drinking from a fire hose. And I, and I imagine that's going to be tough for teachers, too. I think it is tough for teachers. Although, you know, one thing I'm going to say, and I'm going to underscore this and box it and highlight it is, so we've been reporting on civics education for a year and a half now. Over and over, I hear that civics is boring and history is boring and it's irrelevant and it's dry. And it's kind of true that when you say the word civics, I think the first thing that comes to mind are, you know, those portraits with people in powdered wigs and George Washington looked like he just slapped on half a ton of rouge. And this is like proof positive that, you know, civics is not something that happened in 1776 or 1787 when the Constitution was ratified. I mean, this is the Constitution in action. This is something that lives with us every day, right? And to me, that makes civics both seem extremely relevant, but also sort of exciting. 
I think that's a fair way to put it. And certainly, you know, Education Week has done some recent surveys of high schoolers and first-time voters, and we know that their views of current events are pretty fluid right now, aren't they? Yeah. So one of the things that I think is very interesting about this is that when you type civics education on Twitter, you don't get as much people sort of talking about instructional practices as you do sort of people shrieking at each other about how schools are indoctrinating kids one way or the other, or if teachers did their jobs, then we wouldn't have this current administration. And it's such an ear-splitting conversation. And the truth of the matter is that teachers' political beliefs are actually a lot more diverse than we tend to to think. So our, our research center here at Edweek did a nationally representative survey to try to get a sense of, you know, well, where are our teachers and their political beliefs? And we found that about a quarter of teachers identified as liberal, um, 23% as conservative, 43% as, wait for it, moderate. And now it's true that when you ask about particular political parties or candidates, this starts to change. So for example, in 2016, about half of teachers voted for Hillary Clinton and less than a third for Trump. It's not a monolith. And as for students, so we have less data about where students tend to fall out politically. We do know from from other civics research that people below 18 don't really have these hugely fixed political identities yet. It's still quite fluid. We did find that among uh, young people who were able to vote, we did our survey, that about two-thirds said that they did plan on voting, which was overly optimistic, because it turns out that in the midterms in 2018, only about a third did, although that was still pretty record-breaking at the time. Well, it would seem then that this age bracket, you know, these late middle schoolers to high schoolers, it's a pretty important time to be getting them thinking about civics and engaged in the process. I do think it is. I also think that a lot of kids right now are very energized by, for example, the Parkland students or Greta Thunberg and the climate strike walkouts. But I think it's important to keep in mind that the public protest, civil disobedience, some of those things that we would lump in, in sort of that category of activism is really one part of the civics conversation. And so the formal processes of which I would put in, impeachment in, in, the, uh, in that bucket are also really important to learn about. I also think there's a lot of misunderstanding generally. When the Democrats began this inquiry, right, like the Fox, New York Times, the Washington Post, all put out explainers. So it's not as though impeachment is really that well understood by Americans, period, let alone by people at the age where they're getting civics preparation. So I think there's sort of a, a national level of unfamiliarity with this process. Even aside from the possibility of the impeachment, Trump has certainly become his own kind of controversy. What are teachers saying about this in places like Twitter or or Facebook groups where their comments may be more public? I have seen a variety of responses. I mean, I have seen some people saying, this is D-Day for us. Every single school needs to double down on civics education right now. Every, you know, every teacher should be prioritizing this. I think think, though, that there is quite a bit of fear, at least among teachers, of being seen as partisan somehow by bringing this up. And in fact, as I sort of hinted earlier, there's less sort of lesson sharing online. There's some of it, but but less than, for example, than I saw around the midterm elections, which to me seems sort of surprising. You know, I, I thought there would be sort of this flood of networking around this. And the reaction has actually been sort of muted. And a few other teachers I've spoken with sort of confirmed my impression on this. And it's a little hard to know how to interpret that. I mean, on the one hand, you could see it as they're really trying to put together a lesson plan. This is moving very quickly. There are, you know, new revelations or new news developments almost every day. But the other interpretation, the one that sort of worries me, is the idea that this is just so polarizing and fraught that teachers are either legitimately afraid of doing it or at least afraid of talking about how they're doing it publicly. If I'm a local reporter and I want to find teachers who are willing to talk about this, how do I find them? I think this is one to punt to the teachers. And I don't even think I would go to them with a story idea in mind, but instead to check in with the ones that you know, maybe even principals that you trust, and sort of just say, hey, is is anyone in your building doing this? Like, how are they doing this? You know, what are their concerns about doing that? Have any of them come to you and said, 
hey, you're going to back me up if I put a foot into this? I mean, I think the why or the why not in some ways is the story here. And sometimes you will also find out this way, like things that would not have necessarily occurred to you. For example, I asked a source in California, this ended up not even being in my coverage, but, you know, and her response was that one teacher had sort of embraced it. One teacher had really kind of avoided it, I think, from fear of politics. And another said that she just wasn't sure what to do and what she was stumbling on was the Ukraine connection. That's not something that I would have thought about, right? But I think she actually has a point that can a middle schooler find Ukraine on a map, let alone understand 30 years of geopolitics? I mean, you are going to get into that when you start talking about this stuff. And so I think that's a legitimate obstacle that that particular teacher was thinking about. We're talking with Stephen Sawchuk of Education Week about covering the impeachment process and civics education. Don't miss an episode of EWA Radio. You never have to. You can find us on your favorite podcast app. And thank you to everyone who has taken a moment to rate us on iTunes. Your support and feedback are helping us grow. Stephen, in your reporting, you broke up the options for teachers into three possible lenses for how they might approach covering impeachment in their classrooms. I think there are some lessons here for education journalists as well. I'd like to take these one by one. Let's start with background knowledge and civic underpinnings. What does that mean? Well, I think it's sort of what we started this conversation with, which is to say that this is a process that is fairly detailed. It's in the Constitution. The Federalist Papers, uh, 65 and 66 in particular, are a really interesting lens on it because, of course, those were written by Hamilton at a time when they were trying to get anti-Federalists on board. Coming out of the colonial period, there was not really this understanding of what it meant to get rid of your head of state. That's still, I think, a very relevant thing to look at. There are also really good online interactive Constitution websites. And at Edweek, actually, we have a post with a lot of these links, too. There are obviously far more resources for teaching this history. They're often sort of the more generic part of separation and powers and the way the branches of government check each other than they are in the terms of the Trump impeachment inquiry. But I do think that you need to start there to make sure that people understand where the process originated and how it was spelled out by the framers. So that would be the background knowledge. The second lens that you talk about is this historical comparative lens. Let's explain that. Well, so this is a process that has only been used against two presidents. And then, of course, uh, Nixon, that was aborted, but he probably would have been impeached had he not resigned. And each of those, in some ways, is very much, I think, the product of its time. And I think it would be fascinating for a teacher to sort of lay out the articles of impeachment in all three of those cases and had students sort of compare them. There are also really great primary sourcing opportunities here in that the media was covering this in all three of these um, time periods and the, the way in which they were talking about them and the discourse surrounding them. It would be interesting to compare and contrast them. The last lens is this idea of a current lens, and I think that could be the trickiest both for teachers and for journalists. Let's dig into that a little bit. That's really sort of what we would call the current events lens on this. And that gets hard talking about Trump because people's reaction to him tends to be so emotional. And so then that tends to play into how you see, you know, sort of the substance of the policies that the administration is pursuing. You know, here again, I think this is an example where primary sources can really help you as a teacher because there's the whistleblowers report. There are news reports, you know, and although, you know, there, of course, you run into the challenge of vetting which news sources are factual versus those which are opinion. I mean, that's clearly more of a challenge now than it was, you know, 20 years ago. Most of the teachers that I have talked to have really tried to not use a normative lens and to focus on, you know, what is the argument Democrats are making? Like, what processes are they following? How is the Trump administration responding? What documents have they sent out? I think that takes a very structured kind of preparation and teaching. And, you know, one of the things is there's just not a lot out there curriculum-wise for teachers. I mean, you know, in fairness, it takes a while for curriculum companies to develop resources. And teachers don't have that luxury right now. And so I think that's actually one of the reasons we're seeing sort of some hesitation. Let's unpack that for a second, because, I mean, if they don't have those materials that have been sort of, you know, vetted by their curriculum director in the district, they're having to go online and find things. And is this an opportunity where things like open education resources are stepping into the gap? Well, potentially. You know, I'm one of these people that tends to be fairly skeptical. I mean, not of OER more than any other curriculum resource, but 
if you go to some of these online repositories, I mean, you can end up with stuff that's great or you can end up with stuff that's terrible. Some of the ones they've seen that have been more comprehensive, the Choices Project at Brown University, and this is actually a history curriculum that uh, they've been working on. I thought they did a pretty nice job of trying to lay out a lesson that could be taught and that actually integrated pieces from all three of these lenses. So it had some of the historical, it had some of the comparative, it had the media literacy piece in it. The other, you know, frankly, is just the teachers I've seen that have had to sort of design this on their own and have been sharing that with others on how to do it. And those have also been really interesting to sort of dig through. If I'm a reporter and I'm trying to convince my editor that this is a story that I should be writing right now about whether local schools are either teaching or not teaching about the impeachment process in light of the current events, what do I tell her? How do I convince her? You know, for reporters, I would say schools are more or less the only place, I would argue, where there's an opportunity for young people to be guided in some kind of structured, nonpartisan way to make sense of this. Teachers are sort of our first responders on this. And so I think it behooves us to have a sense of how teachers are doing this and whether they're being supported in the way that they need to be supported. I think this is a little bit like sex ed, right? I mean, kids are going to hear about this. They're going to hear about it, whether or not teachers are teaching about it. It's going to be influenced by what their parents have got on the news. It's going to be something that they're talking about on Snapchat or other social media. So not teaching it, I would argue, is a political decision just as teaching it is. I mean, because if you don't teach it, then you're letting a bunch of other potentially wildly inaccurate sources sort of fill the the vacuum. And I sense to a certain extent that there's some discomfort from reporters because, you know, it's not that we necessarily know all the ins and outs of impeachment. I mean, it can be a little embarrassing, right, to, to not know some of the stuff off by heart. But I think it just behooves us to, to talk about this. I think the other argument that you can make to your editor is that... Um, this is a great lever to talk about the state of civics and government teaching generally. I mean, if you find out that this is not being widely taught in your local schools, to me, the next logical question is, well, isn't that a problem? I mean, why might it be that it's not being taught? Then you can start to ask questions that are about, is this purely politics or is this also sort of have to do with the structure of the way we prepare people to be government civics and history teachers? Do we know how many graduates from our programs were trained in these subjects, for example? Does the state even require any specific course on civics? And at what grade level do they require it? And do we know anything about what the preparation for teaching looks like? And do we even know really how parents feel about this? Do they think schools should be helping to interpret this for children or not? Those all seem like rich avenues to me that a reporter could use to say to an editor, look, I want to write about how this is being taught, but I think the answer to that question is probably much bigger than, than it initially seems. As I would argue, it almost always is when you ask about curriculum decisions. Stephen Sachak is an associate editor for Education Week. His beat includes district leadership and management, school safety, and civics education. Steve, thanks for making time for EWA Radio. Thank you. And that wraps up another episode for us. If there's a story you want to know more about, drop us a line at radio at ewa.org. The mission of the Education Writers Association is to strengthen the community of education journalists and improve the quality of education coverage. For more than 70 years, EWA has helped reporters get the story right. Have a great week, and thank you for listening.